Why hello my fellow apes, I hope you're well. As the title says, this is my third response to Cameron Batuzzi's Kalam. After this, we'll each give one more response with concluding remarks, and then, at long last, we'll rest. Now, I have been itching to make this response for nearly four months, as since my last instalment I've delved ever deeper into the literature, both to bolster my own critiques and, more importantly, express better ones. There are some seriously smart people discussing Benedetti paradoxes, and I've learned a lot, such as how to accurately pronounce Benedetti. Jose Benedetti. Thanks, Dr. Malpass. What's more, I've paid a lot of attention to you, the audience, who have expressed your own views through various forums, and I've especially focused on views that think I'm not only doing a very poor job, but that my tone is quite frankly undeserving of Cameron's kindness. This very sentiment, in fact, is extremely prominent in both Cameron's comments and in the comments of other Kalam favouring channels. Given this, I've decided to do something completely out of character. I've decided to take a page out of Cameron's book and follow his structure. Whereas I have consistently dived straight into the arguments and have provided little to no commentary throughout, Cameron has done the opposite. He has consistently dedicated the beginning of all of his videos to providing commentary, and since our intellectual exchange has been largely subsumed by the narrative, I feel it necessary to follow suit. Now, don't worry, this isn't going to affect how much attention I give to the arguments. In fact, I've spent more time here on the arguments than I have before. And on that note, if you're only interested in the arguments, then here's a timestamp please feel free to skip this segment. And more than winning a debate, which I think is important, it's important to win debates. I want truth to be like the main thing. I want truth to flourish. The first thing I'd like to discuss is purpose. Why are Cameron and I even having this discussion? According to Cameron, truth is the primary goal. I want truth to to be like the main thing. Indeed, he made several comments to this effect in his last installment alone. I actually hate it when people's views are misrepresented. This wasn't some like slimy apologist scheme to attack a position that Steven didn't actually hold. And to this I tip my hat as I couldn't agree more. The animation, banter and lighting are subordinate to the truth. It's for this very reason, in fact, that in all of my videos I've hastily dived straight into the arguments, for I know, as does any successful YouTuber, that the first few minutes of a video is the most important. It sets the tone for all to come. But on the contrary, consider the way in which Cameron launched this entire debate. I think it's important at the outset of this series to point out some of the historical inaccuracies that Stephen has made in his previous work. Yeah. Cameron dedicated the first four minutes of his opening seemingly in an attempt to discredit me. That is, before any argument was on the table, before I had uttered a single word, he spent four minutes making me look uneducated and arrogant. Now, whether or not I am those things is completely irrelevant, it's beside the point. The point is that anyone that wants truth to be the main thing. I want truth to be like the main thing. That anyone that wants truth to flourish. I want truth to flourish. Would not open by so obviously poisoning the well as Cameron did. In fact, to the contrary, they would want to not include, to omit any negative traits that their interlocker might have, as to ensure that the audience considers their rebuttals as charitably as possible. Now, the reason why I wanted to address some of these inaccuracies up front is that I hope that it will convince Stephen to be a little bit more precise in the future. I think that he and I can both agree that precision is very, very important. Now, as just seen, Cameron claimed that the only reason he felt it necessary to poison the whale was to convince me to be a little more precise. But the thing is, precision and accuracy are implicit in debates. They're expected. I expect accuracy from Cameron, but I would never trail through his old videos to find what I consider to be mistakes, and then spend the better part of five minutes correcting those mistakes, because one, I'd know that he'd have to dedicate an enormous amount of time to adequately respond to my charges, and two, I'd know that I'm using a very slimy tactic, and that my audience will call me out for it. Now, as I said at the very end of my first video, I really didn't want to bring attention to this at all. And that's just not my cup of tea. But considering that much of Cameron's content consists of these sorts of depictions, that he puts so much emphasis on truth being the primary goal, and that the most popular sentiment in his audience is that his form of discourse is so above my own, I feel obligated to point out such issues from here on out. And this brings me to my second piece of commentary. One of the greatest perks of the format that Cameron and I are trialling here is that each of us is afforded all of the time we need to think through arguments and objections, which at least in theory should result in abundantly fruitful exchange. But one of the worst pitfalls of this format is that it's very easy to lose context since the time between exchange is so long. 
Because of this, Cameron and I have a duty to accurately represent the other side to the best of our abilities, and Cameron even considers this an objective moral duty. So a little background on me, I actually hate it when people's views are misrepresented. Not only is it objectively morally wrong to purposefully misrepresent someone's view, I think it's also just a complete waste of time. Instead of attacking someone's actual position, you waste your time and everyone else's time by attacking a view that no one holds. The key word here, of course, is purposely. And whilst I operate under the assumption that Cameron hasn't purposely misrepresented any of my objections, he has nevertheless misrepresented some. As much as I'd be willing to present each and every instance, it would take way too much time to provide the context. And so what I'm going to do is give a clear example now and then flag future ones as and when they occur. So, after offering my objections to the Grim Messenger scenario, I requested that Cameron present a syllogistic rendition of the Grim Messenger scenario. If Cameron wishes to proceed with the Grim Messenger scenario, I'd like to request that he provide a syllogistic form. Now let's watch the entirety of Cameron's response. Stephen then says that his objection might be a little bit clearer if I were to present a syllogistic form of my argument, so I'll put it back on the screen one more time. Cameron didn't play the segment to his audience of me issuing my request, and that's worked out pretty well for him, as if he had played that segment then his audience would have pointed out that I explicitly asked for a syllogistic form of the Grim Messenger scenario, not his full defence of his first premise. If Cameron wishes to proceed with the Grim Messenger scenario, I'd like to request that he provide a syllogistic form. Further still, Cameron's choice words off so I'll put it back on the screen one more time implies that he's already presented the syllogism, and that I must have missed it. Again, even with this being unintentional, this is great for Cameron's optics. To those that only watch his content, or those who have understandably forgot the request I made three months prior, Cameron appears to be an abundantly patient and kind person, having to deal with a cantankerous fool. And as a final piece of opening commentary, I'd like to hit two birds with one stone, by owning up to a mistake and emphasising the importance of narrative. In my last rebuttal, I charged Cameron with not initially providing a syllogism for his argument from limits. But if you go through the entirety of his opening, you'll notice that this syllogism is nowhere to be found. I'll now play Cameron's response and then provide commentary. It didn't exist until his rebuttal. So here's a quick summary of my defense of my second premise. Premise 9, if there is a first cause, then it has no limits. And we saw why this is true, anything that is limited has a cause. So first and foremost, let me just own the fact that I was wrong. And to Cameron I say, I'm sorry, my bad. Secondly, let me explain why I made this mistake. I watched over Cameron's defence of his second premise several times to see if he had provided a syllogism, and since I couldn't find it, I stated as much. But if I had re-listened to the conclusion of his presentation, then I would have caught him saying it. And let me just emphasise that, he said it and the argument on screen when he said it wasn't the syllogism in question. This is not only far from standard practice, but it's also contrary to how Cameron defended his first premise. And on the note of narrative, the way that Cameron presented this to his audience largely gave the impression that he provided the syllogism during his actual defence. He even primed the segment by saying, If you remember, I presented another supporting argument in defence of my second premise in my opening statement. I'll put it back on the screen for all of us to look at. Indeed, the only sign he gave of his syllogism being in the conclusion as opposed to the actual defence was the timestamp, which is something I appreciate, but yeah, narrative and accuracy are paramount in this format, and I feel that we could both be doing a little better on this front. Anyhow, enough commentary, let's get to the good stuff. Premise 1. There is a first cause. Premise 2. If there is a first cause, then God exists. And the conclusion follows, God exists. Let's begin, as we have throughout this series, with premise one, that there is a first cause. Cameron's argument is predicated on causal finitism, the view that every event or every state has a finite causal history. And throughout his opening, he spoke as if causal finitism establishes a singular first cause. The first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause. Because of this, I objected that the foremost proponent of causal finitism, Dr. Alexander Proust, has made it abundantly clear that causal finitism would not substantiate a singular first cause, and that since Cameron proceeded to act as if it does, he needs to provide an additional argument. Even if causal finitism was true, this would not get us to a singular first cause of the universe. Now to be fair, Cameron doesn't state that it does. He asserts that there is a first cause, which could just mean at least one first cause. 
However, throughout the rest of his presentation, he uses the term a first cause as if it's synonymous with the first cause. So as just seen, I even noted that Cameron doesn't explicitly state that causal finitism would get us to a singular first cause, but that due to him proceeding to speak in the singular over the plural, he was either one, misusing causal finitism, or two, missing a step. I express this again in clearer words a minute later. To be sure, Proust believes that there is a single uncaused cause, but he gives additional arguments for his belief, unlike Cameron. Cameron responded in his first rebuttal by stating that my objection is in relation to his second premise. Stephen's second primary objection is that causal finitism doesn't imply a single first cause. Perhaps, for all we know, the first cause is made up of a plurality of infinitely many things. However, this is actually an objection to my second premise that identifies the first cause as God. And in my second rebuttal, I again reiterated that my objection wasn't to either of his premises, but rather with the ambiguity of his language. The fact that he acted as if causal finitism gets us to a singular first cause. Whilst Cameron acts as if causal finitism substantiates a singular first cause. The first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause, the first cause. The first cause. The of causal finitism, Alexander Proofs, does not. And in Cameron's second rebuttal, which now brings us up to date, here's what he had to say. As I've thought about it, however, I realized that I was actually wrong here. Stephen's second objection doesn't target my second premise. All my second premise says is that if there is a first cause, then God exists. It doesn't claim that there is a single first cause. Moreover, premise seven in my supporting argument merely says that if causal finitism is true, then there is a first cause. Again, it's not claiming that there is a single first cause. So interestingly, this objection targets no premise in any of my arguments. Moving on. So one of the top comments on Cameron's last video expressed frustration at us speaking past each other. And I think this segment really illustrates this concern. My objection was never of Cameron's first or second premise, but rather that he was proceeding as if causal finitism gets us to a singular first cause, that he was effectively missing a premise. Or to put it another way, his singular conclusion of God exists, as opposed to the potentially plural conclusion of at least one God exists, requires us somewhere along the way to eliminate plurality. So interestingly, this objection targets no premise in any of my arguments. Moving on. Now, back when Cameron thought that my criticism was of his second premise, he appealed to Occam's Razor. I'm pretty confident that Stephen has heard of a little principle called Occam's Razor. Which is actually a last resort rather than a good argument. But now that he's finally clarified that his argument doesn't get us to a singular first cause, we can put this whole contention to bed. Before we do this, however, and for the sake of being thorough, let's touch upon his sheep analogy and existential quantifiers. As an analogy, if I claim that there's a sheep in the field, and even refer to the sheep as the sheep, that's not the same as claiming that there's a single sheep in the field. Agreed, a minority of nouns are always plural, and sheep is a good example. And yes, on its own, the word cause is ambiguous in terms of quantity. However, if someone spoke of the sheep in the field by giving a premise that states a sheep as opposed to the sheep, consistently used the word it instead of they. If the first cause wasn't the starting point, if it had prior causes, then trivially it wouldn't be the first cause. Referred to it as a single sheep. We've arrived at a single first cause. And to top it all off, they proceeded to speak as if their argument establishes that there is only one sheep in the field. I'd feel it necessary to point out this issue if only to make their argument stronger. All that's left for the support of this argument is to make the connection to God. So in other words, an unlimited nature points to God. Both of the prior sentences, which are just two examples out of many, indicate singular, especially when you consider that they're spoken in the context of a cosmological argument for the existence of God, as opposed to at least one God. I have a bit more to say on this, but first, let's talk predicate logic. To get a bit more technical, the way that I phrased my first premise is consistent with how philosophers use the existential quantifier in predicate logic. The little symbol that looks like a backward E and an X next to each other actually gets translated there exists an X and is standardly taken to mean that there is at least one X. The first thing I'd like to say here is that in addition to Cameron's first premise being consistent with the existential quantification, it's also consistent with the uniqueness quantification. And that's been my point all along. He's been ambiguous in his language. Secondly, if existential quantification is so important to Cameron's argument, and it certainly is, why didn't he make this clear from the outset, or at least in his first rebuttal? Further still, why did he state in his first rebuttal that he gets from plural to singular during his second premise, Occam's razor, only to reveal in his second rebuttal that, actually, all along, he doesn't get there through any of his premises? So, interestingly, this objection targets no premise in any of my arguments. 
It seems to me, at least, that we've actually made some progress here. But rather than acknowledging the progress and strengthening his argument, Cameron is now making out that he's always intended for his argument to be potentially plural, despite the fact that his prior language, modus ponens, and appeal to Occam's razor heavily suggests otherwise. I genuinely don't know how anyone can watch his opening and not come away with the impression that he was speaking in the singular. But, of course, I might be wrong. And talking of Cameron's modus ponens, I asked him on the phone and through text if he'd be willing to change the wording to clearly indicate the potential plurality of his conclusion, but he said no, for the reasons you can see on screen now. But for what it's worth, here's how I would formulate Cam's kalam to reflect the potential plurality. 1. There is at least one first cause. 2. If there is at least one first cause, then at least one god exists. Therefore, at least one god exists. <laughs> From his five, if the Grim Reaper scenario is impossible, then causal finitism is true. I'm now going to challenge Cameron's fifth premise by offering what I believe is a far superior solution to causal finitism. Let's tentatively assume that premise four is true, that the Grim Reaper, Grim Messenger, or any other Benedetti paradox is impossible. What we now need is a solution that gives us maximal explanatory value for minimum ontological cost. That is, a solution that resolves the paradoxes whilst tethering us to the fewest number of metaphysical commitments. There are many proposed solutions in the literature, and as an example we can consider Dr. Graham Priest's thesis that motion is contradictory. Certainly there are some people who subscribe to contradictions in reality in the sense we're talking about, and I'm one of them. If we assume that motion is contradictory, we can neutralise Benedetti paradoxes that involve motion. But, of course, we'd still be left with spatio-temporal versions, and so this isn't really what we're looking for. Further still, the price tag of some contradictions being true is gargantuan. We'd be paying a massive price for very little explanatory value. Another solution, of course, is causal finitism. If we assume that every event or state has a finite causal history, then we have a solution to Benedetti paradoxes, be them grim reapers, grim messengers, or infinite walls. However, it's worth noting that very similar semantic paradoxes, such as Dr. Stephen Yablo's, remain unscathed, since they don't assume a causal relation. And more importantly, it's vital to acknowledge that the solution of causal finitism has an extremely expensive ontological price tag. To just scratch the surface of the costs, I'm going to tag in the same sharp young man that Cameron did before, Joe Schmidt. You seem, as Proust himself uh, emphasizes, you seem to be bound into saying that, oh, well, space is discrete, not continuous. Time is discrete, not continuous. Well, that, what about some of our best scientific theories that treat, uh, you know, time as continuous? And, you know, so you're, you're starting to get into all these different weeds. Oh, man, space is finite in extent. Ah, time is finite in extent. What about, a, you know... All these sorts of ramifications that are increasing your ontological inventory and the ontological costs that you have to pay. And so all else being equal, we would want a non-causal finitist solution to these things because causal finitism has so many of these costs in terms of its ontological extravagance and what it's going to have to commit us to. And there are certain ways, that you, as you pointed out, that you can try to wiggle around it. So Proust, in his book, Infinity, Causation, and Paradox, as you know, um, he says that his his actual position is that strictly speaking, causal finitism doesn't entail the discreteness of, say, space. But what he has to do to get around that is he has to take a stance on all these other things within the philosophy of physics. He has to take a stand on the nature of um, waves and the nature of particles and things like that, uh, things that are highly contentious within philosophy of physics. And so in order to avoid some of these consequences, you have to further add in these different ontological costs. So I did just want to really emphasize that for the audience, that if we can find a different solution that kills the paradoxes, um, we would prefer that if it has less ontological costs, because causal finitism has so many costs, and that is not appreciated, I don't think, sufficiently within kind of internet circles, at least. By the way, I cannot recommend enough the conversation that Joe Schmidt and Dr. Alex Malpass had. It's extremely illuminating, and they go on to endorse the solution I'm about to present here. Dr. Nicholas Shakel's unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, or as we call it from here on out, the unsatisfiable pair. To build up to the unsatisfiable pair, I'm going to take another page out of Cameron's book and provide a warm-up. I hereby christen this the Grim Height Paradox. Consider the following two propositions of A, Cameron is taller than Stephen, and B, Stephen is taller than Cameron. So we know from the first proposition that Cameron is taller than Stephen, but wait. 
Cameron can't be taller than Stephen since our second proposition states that Stephen is taller than Cameron, and our second proposition can't be true because our first proposition states that Cameron is taller than Stephen. Thus we've arrived at an explicit contradiction. We are both taller than each other, and yet both also not taller than each other. So I guess this proves that nobody can be taller than anybody else. Wow, that is incredible, and to think I discovered this extraordinary metaphysical truth from the warm comfort of my armchair. Who needs physicists, right? Rather than giving them grants, just support me on Patreon. Or, and bear with me here, maybe it's got nothing to do with the garb and everything to do with the logic. Perhaps it's just simply the case that the two propositions are incompatible, and thus they can't be jointly satisfied. I mean, if we remove the garb, we're left with two propositions, one stating that P is greater than Q, and the other stating that Q is greater than P. And now we see the logic, it's very apparent that the contradiction has nothing to do with height. It's simply a fact that both of the propositions can't be jointly satisfied. Now just as this contradiction is in no way predicated on the garb of height, in the Benedetti paradoxes precisely the same is true of the garbs of causation and time. To spell this out, I'm going to paraphrase how Schmidt explained it in a comment on the aforementioned video. All Benedetti paradoxes consist of two purely abstract claims. A. The set is infinite, for example the set of negative integers, minus 3, minus 2, and so on. And B. A rule that states the property P holds at member M, for any member M, if and only if P holds nowhere before M. It's important to note that before relates to the ordering. It has nothing to do with temporal or causal considerations, etc. So in this case, it would be all negative numbers below a particular given number. So if we let m be minus 3, then before m refers to minus 4, minus 5, and so on. Alright, let's spell out the contradiction. Pick some arbitrary member m from the infinite set. For instance, minus 666. Now by our rule, p holds at minus 666 if and only if p holds nowhere before minus 666. So let's suppose that p holds at minus 666 in which case p holds nowhere before minus 666. But wait a second, what about the member located immediately before minus 666? Does p hold at minus 667? Yes and no. We've arrived at an explicit contradiction. Fred is dead, and Fred is not dead. Why no? Because we've assumed that p holds at minus 666. And so, by our rule, p holds nowhere before minus 666. And so it can't hold at minus 667. And why yes? Because in the case we've been considering, p holds nowhere before minus 667. And so, according to our rule, p must hold at minus 667. So we have an explicit contradiction. p holds at minus 667, and p doesn't hold at minus 667. And remember, the member we've been considering here is completely arbitrary. And so our reasoning applies to any member we pick be it minus 3, minus 5,923, etc. Therefore, it follows that property P doesn't hold at any member. But wait, hold up. If property P doesn't hold at any member, then it must hold at whatever member we consider, since it doesn't hold for all members before the one we consider. Hence, whether we suppose that property P holds at some member, or we suppose that property P doesn't hold at any member, we get a contradiction. And because we've got the contradiction with no reference to causation, it's evident that causation isn't relevant. This is vital, and so I'll state it again, but in other words. Note that this contradiction does not occur due to temporal or causal considerations, but rather simply because the schematic pair are logically inconsistent. They are jointly unsatisfiable. Thus, Benedetti paradoxes don't result in contradiction, but rather start in logical inconsistency. And the many garbs only serve to obfuscate this fact. The mistake that Cameron and other Kalam proponents make is that they blame the first condition for the contradiction, the set with no first member, be it an infinite division of time in the case of the Grim Reaper paradox, or an infinite extent of time in the case of the Grim Messenger paradox, when in actuality the contradiction has absolutely nothing to do with causal or temporal considerations, and everything to do with the fact that the logical schematic pair can't be jointly satisfied. To assert that Benedetti paradoxes prove the impossibility of, say, infinite causal chains, really is as absurd as asserting that nobody can be taller than anybody else because of the prior grim height paradox. It's just, in the Benedetti case, it's not intuitively easy to recognise. Now likewise to causal finitism, the unsatisfiable pair neutralises Benedetti paradoxes, but it also neutralises very similar semantic paradoxes, including the one I offered a few moments ago, Yablo's paradox. 
Hence, in the context of paradoxes that are structurally similar to Benedetti's, the unsatisfiable pair has greater explanatory value than causal finitism. But what of the ontological cost, I hear you say? If the unsatisfiable pair has relatively greater explanatory value than causal finitism, then surely it has a greater ontological price tag, right? No. To the contrary, it's nearly free. Its only cost is to assume that contradictions are impossible, and since causal finitists also pay this price, when the two solutions are compared, the unsatisfiable pair is free of charge, and for this reason it's objectively a better solution. Unlike causal finitism, the unsatisfiable pair doesn't force us to commit ourselves to such things as spatiotemporal finitism. So that will do for now as I don't want to bombard Cameron with too much to respond to. I will, however, reiterate my prior objections to the Grimm Messenger paradox in the context of this new solution. If you remember, I said that the Grimm Messenger paradox is functionally impossible. It's a functional impossibility. And you can consider the unsatisfiable pair the logical rendition of that objection, which, as I'm sure Cameron will appreciate, is very productive since it allows us to avoid the specifics of the garbs to focus exclusively on the logic that they all employ. Or in other words, the fact that the second condition in the Grimm Messenger paradox is an infinite extent of time is as relevant as the fact that my Grimm height paradox fixates on height. It's irrelevant. Given this, a debate on actual and potential infinites will only serve as a distraction. Okay, so let's move on to the second premise of my argument. For reference, it says that if there is a first cause, then God exists. In defense of his second premise, Cameron provides premises 9 through 12, and much of our focus has revolved around premise 9. That, if there is a first cause, then it has no limits. And in defense of premise 9, Cameron has given us his argument from limits, which consists of premises 13 through 16. In support of my premise 9, I argue that anything that is limited has a cause. So this premise, premise 13, has been our primary contention, and unfortunately I think it served as another instance of us talking past each other. Given this, I'm going to take some time to really spell out what my objection is. Let's take Cameron's argument from limits, and, as we have before, replace all instances of the word limited with exists. Premise 13. Anything that exists has a cause. Premise 14. If the first cause exists, then it has a cause. Premise 15. The first cause does not have a cause, from the definition of first cause. Therefore, the first cause does not exist. 14 and 15 modus tollens. Likewise to Cameron's argument from limits, my argument from existence is valid. But unlike Cameron's argument, mine doesn't require you to assume the existence of something we have absolutely no examples of, the uncaused. As Cameron said himself, Absolutely nothing, like no object at all in our experience is uncaused. Indeed, I can even employ the exact same inductive generalization as Cameron, that Part of the reason why we think that rocks and branches and people and cars and mountains have causes is because They exist. Thus, and to bring Ockham back into the swing, I would maintain that my argument from existence is objectively a better proposal than Cameron's argument from limits since it makes less assumptions. Cameron's assumes the uncaused, whereas mine doesn't. Ironically enough, mine merely relies on the inductive generalization that Cameron's been defending throughout. To expand upon this issue further, note that since everything we experience has a cause, we can employ the same inductive generalization in relation to pretty much anything. Pick an attribute or quality. Now as a truly, thoroughly unlimited thing, it would have no limit in power. Alrighty, power it is. We have countless examples of things with power, and so far as we can tell, all of them have a cause. We can thus reasonably infer, so says Cameron's logic, that, probably, every instance of power has a cause. So let's replace the word limited with powerful. Premise 13. Anything that is powerful has a cause. Premise 14. If the first cause is powerful, then it has a cause. Premise 15. The first cause does not have a cause, from the definition of first cause. Therefore, the first cause is not powerful. 14 and 15. Modus tollens. In knowledge. Yes, good shout. Let's replace the word limited with knowledge. For everything we've ever seen with knowledge has a cause. We now have a valid argument stating that the first cause has no knowledge. In goodness. Goodness, that's a good one. Okay, let's just put that in and there we go. And just like that, we have a valid argument demonstrating that the first cause can't be good. Or in other words, the first cause is a bad boy. So why is it that we can plug into Cameron's argument from limits pretty much whatever we want the first cause or first causes to have? The answer is, the argument is begging the question via contraposition. 
In logic and mathematics, the logically equivalent, the contrapositive, of the form if p then q is not q then not p. Take, for instance, the assertion that all humans, p, were born q. The contrapositive of this statement is anything that was not born, not q, is not human, not p. Now let's take Cameron's 13th premise, which is his first in his argument from limits, that anything that is limited, p, has a cause, q. The logical equivalent of this is that anything that does not have a cause, not q, is not limited, not p. And since this is quite literally the very thing Cameron is trying to prove, his argument from limits is begging the question. In other words, he's trying to prove that anything that does not have a cause is not limited, and the logical equivalent of one of his premises is anything that does not have a cause is not limited. Now, as already mentioned, the defence that Cameron has given for this extraordinary claim is the inductive generalisation that since everything we know of that is limited has a cause, we can infer that, probably, all limited things have causes. And admittedly, this intuitively comes across as a humble claim. But it isn't, for the same reason that replacing the word limited with existence isn't a humble claim. To be clear, there's good reason for us to operate with the assumption that if something exists, it's probably got a cause. But the claim that anything that exists has a cause doesn't embody this humility. To the contrary, this is a very, very bold claim, but it looks innocent until one recognises the contraposition. The last thing I want to say on this topic, and I'll keep it brief, is that Cameron's claim that I didn't provide any new objections to his argument from limits in my second rebuttal Stephen provided no new objections to my second premise is simply not true. Following this example, let's take Cameron's argument from limits and replace the word limited with good and not limited with not good. And finally, let's touch upon Cameron's mic drop moment. Throughout this series, I've been emphasising that despite having no examples of anything that's uncaused, Cameron is confidently asserting what properties and qualities uncaused things necessarily have. But I've been missing an important caveat that Cameron has now brought to the forefront. It's actually fairly easy to demonstrate that something uncaused must exist. Okay, then why all the time wasting with the Grim Benedetti paradoxes? Cameron should have just opened up with this easy demonstration. So consider for a moment the totality of everything that exists. So here's an important question. According to whose model of the totality of everything that exists? In Cameron's model, at least one god exists, and so at least one god is part of the totality of everything that exists, whereas mine has no need for this assumption. Now, for the sake of being thorough, let's continue with both models in mind. It's impossible that the totality of reality has some kind of outside cause. By definition, there can't be something like outside of everything that exists. Agreed. And so, in Cameron's model, the gods can't have created the totality of everything that exists since they are part of the totality of everything that exists. I'm just giving this rightful emphasis. Hence, either the totality itself or some part of the totality exists without a cause. Right, so in my model, the grand universe, whether it consists of a multiverse or whatever, is uncaused, it's existed forever. Whereas in Cameron's model, either the gods are just part of the grand universe that's existed forever, and so they didn't create everything else, or they are the only thing that exists that's uncaused, and everything else exists because they were caused by the gods. But in such a case, Ockham wants another word. My model makes one assumption, that the totality of everything is uncaused, whereas Cameron's model makes many assumptions, namely that the only thing or things that are uncaused are beings that are unlimited in power, unlimited in knowledge, unlimited in goodness, and so on and so on and so on. I would drop this mic, but it's on a stand. The last thing I'd like to propose is that we take Cameron's causal inductive generalization to its conclusion. Absolutely nothing, like no object at all in our experience is uncaused. <sighs> Actually, Cameron, the object that is the totality of everything that exists must be uncaused. I would drop this mic, but it's on a stand. But putting this aside, it's true that we have no examples whatsoever of anything within the totality of everything that's uncaused. What's more, despite our voyage into general relativity and quantum mechanics, nothing has violated the law of conservation of energy. Everything appears to be creatio ex materia, the rearrangement of already existing things. It's partly for this reason that many of our most prominent models of the totality of everything are causally cyclical. n causes m1, n1 causes n2, n2 causes n, and so on and so on without end. But what's my point? Well, a causally cyclical model utilises all of Cameron's best arguments, makes way less assumptions than Cameron, and doesn't have any friction with, say, the problem of evil, etc. Food for thought. 
Finally, let me reiterate my question. How is it that Cameron can confidently assert what properties uncaused things necessarily have when the only instance we have is the totality of everything? The essence of my question remains. Anyhow, to conclude his last rebuttal, Cameron expressed a bit of love, and after playing it here, I'll do the same. I apologise for the length of this video, but as stated at the beginning, a large proportion consists of Cameron's content for context. I'm not going to do like a whole summary of this video like I've done in my two previous videos, so sorry in advance for that, but I'm going to leave you with this. Stephen, despite our disagreements, I love you like a brother, and I'm not saying that just for internet points. I'm really, really sorry to hear about what happened to your dad, and I just also wanted to say thank you so much for the comments that you sent to me about Ben. So I just really appreciate that. I'm really looking forward to actually getting a real cup of tea with you in person one day. Cameron, my fellow ape, the love is mutual. You and I are in the same boat, both earnestly trying to find meaning and truth in a vast sea that envelops us. And whilst we might not see eye to eye, know that I have nothing but respect for your courage and conviction. Oh, and by the way, when we finally do meet for a tea, beer or holy water, the first round is on me. Take care of yourself, Cameron, and continue to carry a big heart.